Welcome to the Tesla Power Podcast, the unofficial Tesla energy community covering solar panels, solar roof, and power wall for your home. I'm Aaron Brady. Today, let's talk about a Tesla res residential energy product, uh, project in Austin. Let's talk about litigation over the Solar City acquisition. Let's talk about an Australian house that generates 100 kilowatt hours a day with Tesla uh, power wall. And let's calculate what it would take to cover our electricity usage. Let's do it. So let's kick it off with audience participation time. This is the portion for questions, comments, and community input. You can participate in two ways. You can call 203-816-5150, leave a message. You re can record your message, video or audio, and email that to teslapowerpodcast at gmail.com. Comment this week, HM writes, quote, beware of solar edge inverter. I've had two fail since 2019 and have been down for close to two months waiting on Tesla to replace the failed second end quote. HM, that sucks. And I mean, I wonder if the reliability of those solar edge inverters might be part of the reason that Tesla started making their own inverters. I mean, as you probably already know, you know there's inverters in every electric car they make and they over-engineer those units. Here's a uh, shot of our Tesla inverter. I did a quick video, in fact. Let's take it full screen. There we go. Uh, you can see, once I open the case, that the inverter itself is fully enclosed in that single aluminum block. You can also see that uh, the, there's a liquid cooling loop. This is the pump. These are the in and the outs for that. And this liquid cooling you know, increases the operating temperature and range, and it increases the life of the unit, you know, very similar to what they do in the Powerwall 2. Um, you can find some great detail from an article on uh, clean energy reviews link below of course let's pull that up here uh, they covered the full system including the powerwall 2 and the tesla solar inverter i believe the contacts are in canal for greater thermal performance it's the same material they use in the car inverters at scale already um, it's also interesting that they offer a longer warranty than any other manufacturer so their engineering chops are good enough that they're confident in the longevity of the product. Now, there's a couple of uh, reviews out there already. Uh, you'll see one from Solar Surge. They do a good review. It's very neutral. In fact, um, you know, maybe not so neutral. Uh, Joe Ordia calls it a big fat nothing burger because it's older string inverter technology. I mean, there's more to it. Obviously, they've got liquid cooling. They've got proprietary power electronics. Uh, they use the Inconel contacts. All of that makes it a bit cooler than a big fat nothing burger. But then there's also a review from Pacific SunTech. Uh, they do a comparison between the Tesla inverter and the solar edge inverter specifically. It's not a glowing review. I would say, you know, in general, that part of the problem with solar installers and the you know established industry professionals in general is that Tesla doesn't really play nice with others. It's not that their tech won't work with others, it's that the company's priority is vertical integration and direct customer sales rather than working with established solar installers. In fact, with the recent change in Tesla's business model to require solar and Powerwall in a single purchase, third-party installers that had put Tesla Powerwalls in their designs are really getting screwed. And I mean, this didn't start with Tesla. You know, many of you know that Tesla Energy Division is a result of the Solar City acquisition in 2016. Um, here's their Solar City Wikipedia page. You know, um, they sold purchase uh, power purchase agreements directly to customers, and uh, those power purchase agreements were really difficult for traditional equipment installers to compete with, and that was because there was no cash outlay for the customer. Of course, the customers didn't own the system, right? It was an interesting market innovation. It helped accelerate solar adoption for a time, and it did propel Solar City to the number one installer in the country for a time. But I think most would agree it probably wasn't the best way to roll out solar. It wasn't a sustainable way to do it. So if I, you know, this swallowed up a lot of business from third-party installers, and they haven't forgotten it. And truthfully, Tesla isn't doing any better at being a partner than Solar City was. You know, so it's not a huge surprise that Solar Surgeon. Pacific SunTech are a bit harsh in their reviews of the Tesla inverter. Um, 
I, I would consider posting my own comparison, actually, because I have access to my brother-in-law's Solar Edge inverter and give it a bit of balance, you know, to these two reviews. Uh, but to be clear, HM, um, you know, I couldn't find a ton of online threads, you know, that mentioned these issues. And my brother-in-law, he hasn't had an issue himself. But I don't know. You might see if there's a way to switch over from the Solar Edge inverter to the Tesla inverter. I mean, I totally get that your Solar Edge unit is probably still under warranty, so it wouldn't cost you anything to do this swap, and it might cost you something to go to the Tesla inverter. But I mean, is it really worth the trouble to continually swap out these units? You know, I mean, it's it's got to be terrible for production. I mean, if you're out right now, you're missing the best solar production days of the year. I, I really feel for you. I hope you're able to sort it out for good and quickly. Thank you for sharing and. That's our comment this week. If you have something to contribute, please do. The more input we get, the more useful the pod will be for those that are looking into Tesla residential energy products. Now, let's get into the news. The Austonian reports on a large development project that'll include uh, that'll incorporate Tesla solar glass roof and power walls. Their byline, quote, Tesla will build the nation's most sustainable neighborhood in southeast Austin, end quote. So my first thought is, how much are these houses going to cost? <laughs> the solar glass roof just went through a significant price hike. And I mean, any way you look at it, it's going to be a huge percentage of the cost to build any home. So let's check out the configurator to see what Tesla's quoting for systems these days. Um, to get an accurate quote, we'll want to go to um, Google Maps. So you can see here um, the Austin area. We can see downtown Austin just above the uh, river here. We can see that park that they mention in the um, article, McKinney Falls State Park. And it's going to be up here in the southeast Austin area. Um, I'm just going to pick one of the houses that's near this planned development. I'll use the address to estimate what area we have for solar. So pulling that address and going over to Project Sunroof, you can see uh, that the property has about 2,500 square feet available for solar. So we're going to take that data and we're going to go over to Tesla.com and plug all of that in. And when we go to get a summary for that, we can see that they recommend about a 20 kilowatt system and that the price is going to clock in at around 70 75,000 dollars so i um you know i don't think that the developers are going to pay that price you know that's really a an end user price but i think that we all know that tesla can't do that for much less and keep this whole thing profitable it could be interesting seriously interesting if tesla just sells the hardware and the developer provides the integration labor right Especially at scale, this could be closer to the efficiency that Tesla needs to achieve, you know, to make this whole thing um, um, successful and profitable. Um, so let's see how much the house would cost as is. Um, and then we'll add the cost of the solar glass roof and then compare all of that with the development pricing they're planning now. So we'll go full screen on Zillow. Uh, we can see that the address we just priced, it comes in at about $545,000. And if we add the $75,000 for the solar glass roof, we're going to be at about $620,000 for a, um, yeah, we'll be at about, yeah, if we add the $75,000 for the solar glass roof, we're at $620,000 for the home in this area, accounting for the addition of that solar glass roof. Um, and I mean, interestingly, we can get a sense already of how much those houses are gonna be in this development. Um, if we bring up the Easton Park um, website, here we can see the development website has sections uh, of each community uh, each with a price ranged for us already. The Brookfield portion of it is going to be somewhere in the 400s, but I don't see these including the solar glass roof, right? That's not going to be high enough price. If we go full screen, we can see over here in the Perry Homes, um, I think we'll see them in the Perry Homes development price range. You know, those properties are starting in the 600s. Uh, they'd be 
the upscale price that could capture the most value for both Tesla and for the developers. Um, yeah, so they have a division work, or they've given the division a working title, Sunhouse, and work's just started. We can expect only a handful of houses to, to be completed this year, but we may be talking about a couple dozen sold by this time next year. Uh, this deal is bringing in a couple of helpful things for Tesla residential business specifically. The most important bit is scale. You know, existing homes that need a new roof are going to be a good business, but I can see that new construction is going to kick this up to the next level. Let's um, take a look at housing starts. So the U.S. Census keeps track of this, and we can see that new housing starts, um, there are more than one and a half million new homes under construction at the moment. Uh, did I? No, I should be here. So right here, housing starts, we have 1.572 million houses under construction. So Tesla can provide not just, uh, okay, so if Tesla can provide not the labor, but just the physical products at 50K per house, uh, for maybe just 10% of these housing starts, we're looking at a $7.5 billion annual revenue just for new construction. So I don't know. We're, um, there were uh, several analysts that were asking questions along this line uh, during the first quarter of last year, and they wanted to know if this specific trajectory was already in the works. Tesla wouldn't comment, but this seems inevitable and honestly a very efficient way to scale Tesla energy. Uh, residential energy products. Let's go on to the next story. Um, just queuing it up here. So Reuters reports on the upcoming litigation from shareholders against Elon Musk over the Solar City acquisition back in 2016. The board, they've already settled the case. So Elon's going solo into the trial. You'll have heard a couple of uh, videos, you know, one from, um, uh, from Solving the Money Problem. Uh, Stephen Mark Ryan, he's uh, pretty, pretty brutal about the whole thing. But this specific article, it focuses on who controls Tesla. Their thought is that a judgment in favor of the lawsuit would confirm that Elon was con the controlling shareholder and that he had the capacity to ram the deal through, even though it wasn't... Um, from a majority shareholder, and it wasn't in the best interest of majority shareholders. Um, I don't know. I mean, I happened to be a, um, a Tesla shareholder at the time. I did happen to vote against the acquisition. I, I thought it was a huge and unnecessary distraction from the car business. I mean, that hadn't even become profitable yet, you know? So since, obviously, I've come around, but, it, you know, it's hard to remember how controversial it was at the time. In fact, I found this old article... Um, here, it's a CNN article from 2016, and it points out, if we get up to the top of it, yeah, it, it points out that uh, other board members, you know, recused themselves from the vote, including Elon, but that institutional shareholders were still largely in favor of the deal. And they quote further down here, right here, uh, institutional shareholder services which advises mutual funds and other institutional shareholders in such matters, recommended the investors vote in favor of the deal. The influential firm said the acquisition was a necessary step toward Tesla's goal of being an integrated, sustainable energy company, end quote. Now, I would say that if it's all about Elon's vision, then shareholders aren't necessarily being given priority, you know, score one for the suit. But I mean, is it right for shareholders to guide the company? I mean, is it ever shareholder vision that brings awesome things into the world, which then translates into value for shareholders? No, not often anyway. I, I don't see these plaintiffs winning, even though I was you know on their side at the time. And, and there was another interesting bit from that article um, right here at the end. Uh, it says, um, you know, it jumped out at me when I was rereading, you know, uh, the article. Um, they were pointing out the value for the merger. Quote, Tesla said it expects Solar City to add more than half a billion dollars in cash to Tesla's balance sheet over the next three years. End quote. It barely provided that cash. But recently, it's been a cash loser, 
like this last quarter, they operated at a loss. And there's serious doubts that it's going to be a net cash contributor anytime soon. Especially if you consider the solar portion that Solar City was bringing to the table, right? Tesla Energy, for the most part, has been sustained by its battery and integrated software sales. The solar glass roof was its great white hope as far as Solar City's contribution, but it wasn't even a real product yet. So I don't know. I think the pieces are coming together for that product to finally take off, but it's been a slow road and we're going to have to wait a bit longer for that vision to become the great value generator Elon promised five years ago. Last up, let us talk about Auto Evolution. They did a feature on a house in Australia that produces 100 kilowatt hours of energy per day. Uh, this is touted as an enormous amount of energy. It is not, especially not in the world we're moving toward. So the article notes, quote, the garden house, as it was named, is located in Melbourne, Australia, and it can produce more than five times the energy used by an average house in Australia. While an ordinary house uses approximately 19 kilowatt hours of energy per day, the garden house generates 100 kilowatt hours, end quote. They're sipping power over there in Australia. So, I mean, we're not energy sippers here in the United States. The U.S. Energy Information Administration, let's pull that up. So it um, puts average house uh, household usage at 29 kilowatt hours per day. We take their 10,649 kilowatt hours of yearly consumption, divided by 365, of course. Um, it's lower than I had expected, uh, though, you know, we're going to run through the energy consumption at this house later in the pod. It's still higher than the Australian consumption noted in the article, and it's just a tiny check on the optimism of this article. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's still three times the average usage in the U.S. home, or in U.S. homes, so I should give it some props. You know, their 17 kilowatt hour solar array is backed up with those two Tesla power walls. What's bananas to me is that they note that the owners have Tesla Model 3s that are powered by this system. I mean, they must not be driving much because those cars alone could be slurping up more than half of their daily production. This also presumes they'll produce 100 kilowatt hours every day, but there's going to be seasonal variability. There's going to be daily variability in their production. And I expect this is probably near or at their max generation. So I'm a little Debbie Downer on this, but you'll see why when we go through the energy usage here in our home and what it would take for us to cover our usage. Anyway, that wraps the new segment this week. Let's get a little interlude, get a snack, and let's get into what it might take to cover our energy usage with solar here at the house. So we have had a bit of sun and I have some more videos that I wanna share of the roof. Uh, the weeds in the yard, they're getting angrier, and uh, there's a couple of uh, shots in these videos where you can see weeds growing in the rain gutters. Super classy. Um, let's pull up that first video. The first video I have actually is um, while it's raining. I really like the way it looks when it's raining. Uh, put it full screen there. You know, it's not like an asphalt roof where you can't really see the drops coming off the roof. With a solar glass roof, you can see all of the drops beating up as they roll off the tiles. Really looks nice. Um, I've got a couple more videos where it gets, um, you know, a bit sunnier. So let's go to the next one. It's another raining one. This is off of the addition of the house, off the back of the house. And you can see here the gutter tops have been taken off. Um, Tesla had removed the gutter covers to install the roof and didn't put them back. I mean, I guess they didn't say they were going to put them back, but I had assumed that after the roof was done, they would put back together what they had taken apart. False. So uh, we not only have weeds in our yard, we also have weeds on our roof. <laughs> you can see some of them in some of these shots. At least we're in fertile parts here in Connecticut, right? God's country. Seriously, I love it here. Let's uh, look at one of the sun sunshine ones. This is out at the front of the house. It'll play up for us. I'll just skip forward a little bit. There's one that's a little bit closer, and there's a couple of interesting features that I wanted to point out about it. That's how, you know, in the sunshine, especially after a rain, it really makes those um, tiles look a little bit glossy, really nice. So let's pull this. Uh, let's see. 
should have. Yeah, here's one. So this is quite close. Uh, this should be, I think, the front of the house. Um, and what you'll find interesting about the tile configuration or the tile layout is the tiles aren't laid right on the top of the roof. They are you know, clipped into these plastic holders. And um, at the end of the video, you can see that those plastic holders are a bit slotted. So let me skip down there to the end of the video. And what that does is that allows moisture, well, it allows airflow to get under those tiles so that moisture can be wicked away. It's not that the rain is getting under there because generally the rain's being shed off by the tiles at the top, but it's for like high humidity situations where, you know, just ambient air moisture is getting into, you know, the different components of the roof. And if you don't have airflow that can get under those tiles to wick away that moisture, then you can cause damage in the system. So that was something that uh, not a lot of people are pointing out. It's something that I wanted to point out for you guys. So, um, what we need to get into now is our energy consumption um, and, you know, what happened in our first full month of generation. So I've got our spreadsheet here. Uh, this here is showing our 2020 usage as it actually was. Um, it's the actual consumption from May 2020 through April 2021. We're basically energy hogs. The uh, EIA numbers, they're going to skyrocket as electric car adoption increases. The high average uh, for EIA was in Louisiana at 16 megawatts per year, 16,000 kilowatts. I mean, that's uh, what, 43 kilowatt hours per day. Um, but we are handily over that by, I don't know, like 20% or so. We use an average of 51 kilowatt hours of electricity per day, or we used that last year. And that was in a pandemic. You know, once we're commuting regularly again, this is going to be much higher. I mean, think about when we get a second electric car, that's going to up our usage, maybe another third or so and put us even further into deficit. So let's zoom in a little bit. We're going to do a little adding up of all the energy we've been using since we've had um, the system powered on. Let me uh, start with the Tesla app. I'm going to start my screen share so that I can then share with you guys. Um, we have a full month of uh, data for June. So I think that's what we'll use for these calculations. I just gotta get this thing sized correctly. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it resizes incorrectly. Um, every time I relaunch it. So there we go. Here's the uh, Tesla app. Got to bring it into the foreground so it follows me more quickly. There we go. So we can see um, something really nice about the app is that it will aggregate monthly numbers for us. And we can see that in June. So we're going to do it by month. We're in June. And our home usage was 2,317 kilowatts uh, of electricity in June. And then we can also see what we produced. So if we filter by production, uh, we can see we produced 1,729 kilowatt hours of electricity in June. So let's take those two numbers. I've got actually a spreadsheet going. So let's pull up the spreadsheet for June usage. You can see that there. Should be big enough, but let's make it full screen for for those, uh, those eyes that'll find it better in this uh, configuration. So it shows a deficit of 588 kilowatts in June, for the 30 days in June anyway. <clears throat> we can see that we needed to produce um, another 20 kilowatt hours of electricity per day to cover the shortfall, but, but there's a little twist here. It's kind of a nasty surprise, really. So let's go back to the app, if we show what we took from the grid for June, we see that it's not 586 kilowatt hours or 588 kilowatt hours. It's 809 kilowatt hours. What's up with that? Well, that's conversion loss. <laughs> Don't forget, we're converting the DC current from the solar roof and battery into the AC current that our house can use. 
So of the 17, 29 kilowatt hours we generated, let's go back to the spreadsheet. Um, we lost 221 kilowatt hours of generation, which is about 13% to conversion loss. I mean, that's not nothing. And honestly, it's a bit discouraging. So ev to even have a hope of covering our usage, we need to overproduce by 13%. Lucky 13, I guess. So let's take our 2,315 um, kilowatt hours that we used. We'll add 13%. And back at the spreadsheet, if we make it full screen, um, we can see here, so we're going to take our June usage, we're going to multiply it by our conversion loss. How did that go to zero? Oh, I see. So our conversion loss percentage isn't showing right. So let's fix this formula, right? So... Um, yeah, so we'll do our loss percentage. It's going to be this divided by equals this divided by this minus one, but we want the absolute value of that. Oh man, I have to click in there. With the absolute value of the whole thing. <laughs> Painful, but worth it in the end. All right, there we go. Um, oh, I didn't do that right. So our conversion loss percentage should be an absolute value, but it needs to be... Oh, of the actual generation. Um versus the loss, right? Because we need the loss percentage. So there's that and then that. So we need to divide our conversion loss by, in actual kilowatt hours, by the amount we generated and we need that absolute value. No. Because we don't need to subtract one. Yeah, we just need a straight up kind of percentage. Right, so that gives us our 13%. And then um, in this formula, what we're doing is we're taking our June usage and we're multiplying it by the conversion loss to see what we need to produce. So this is the generation required accounting for that conversion loss. So um, that means we're gonna need to produce 2,613 kilowatt hours in a month. Now, our 13 and a half kilowatt hour system is generating only 1,729 kilowatt hours per month, uh, you know, with that current um, um, generation, um, you know, based on weather and time of year. But let's see how big the system needs to grow to cover us. So um, in order to calculate that, you can see it must have added a line here. So this E11 reference is just off by a line. Yeah, both of them are off by a line. So let's re... So that there's the actual generation and there's the required generation. So we'll take the percentage of those and then the absolute value difference. Oh, which is what this is. Great. So here we don't need an absolute value. Here we need to take the system multiply it by the increase required. Oh, but we need to add one. One. 
one plus. Good lord. All right, there we go. So we can see um, that we'll need to grow the system about 34% to cover June, and that equals a total system of 18 kilowatt hours. And this is before getting another electric car. Now, aside from this, you know, I want to remind you guys that, um, you know, what we had in our layout. So let's pull up that layout. Um, just want to zoom in on it for you guys. So you can see here, this is the layout of our current system. And we've already covered everything we can for efficient solar generation. Our roof doesn't have more real estate suitable for more power generating tiles. You know, we're going to be on the shaded sides here uh, behind, our uh, behind our garage right here, non-solar tiles, and then on the other side of our addition. That means that traditional solar is likely going to be the only way for us to become energy neutral. So I honestly didn't expect that. I thought we would be able to at least get close to covering our usage with our current system. And then, you know, the car totally blows that out of the water. Right now, you know, we could, I guess, put a four and a half kilowatt system out back and maybe, you know, make it look good even, right? Just do solar panels as like a pergola roof or something or a pavilion roof. And, you know, I need to look into it over the next couple of years, but I mean, we, you know, we'd have to bump that up to maybe like an eight kilowatt hour system once we get the next electric car. This is assuming a lot, but we'll be talking more about this in future episodes. So let's talk about our interaction with Tesla. I got an email from Tesla this week uh, to book our witness test with our utility. I was really confused by this. Uh, we've been power on, you know, for what, a month and a half? Should we not have been? Our communication with Tesla has been pretty poor. You know, it's been really hard to know for sure what we should be doing. Um, what I can say, though, is that we would have missed out on, you know, the highest generation days of the year. You know, this is driven, of course, by the length of days. You know, June 21st is the longest day of the year. You know, that's the solar solstice. And, um, you know, what are we going to just keep the system off? I don't know. It's just really tough to know for sure. Um yeah, it's just really tough to know for sure what um, what you would need to do. But I don't know. I, I can't possibly believe that the delay is United Illuminating. So after inspection, United Illuminating, they were out here just a couple of days after um, they were done with inspection to install the meter and test the system. You'll remember in uh, you know one of the first couple of episodes that I was talking about the UI techs, they were geeking out about the system. Uh, they were geeking out about the battery, you know, the whole thing. They were very quick and enthusiastic about getting this done. So I suspect that Tesla simply hadn't booked a witness test. Either Tesla didn't have anyone available or, I don't know, they just let it slip through the, the, the cracks. So I don't know. I really hope there's no problem with the system having been operational for the last month and a half. Um, we'll see. And I'll tell you about it in the next pod. And... That wraps episode 10 of the Tesla Power Podcast, the unofficial Tesla Energy community. I'm Aaron Brady. Does anyone know what's going on with the referral program? I mean, I don't know. Use my code. It's in the description. If you're looking for any Tesla products, you can save a few bucks and get some free supercharging by going to ts.la slash Aaron62310 to place your order. Thanks for hanging out all the way to the end for the changes in the formulas, but I think it's very informative and very helpful to understand where we're making those con uh, uh, calculations. Let's do it again next week.